Ladies and gentlemen, dear Senator Broster, dear viewers on the screens, and last but not least, dear Marion Foucault, I would like to welcome you most warmly to today's event and to the awarding of the Siegfried Lancet Prize 2021 to Professor Marion Foucault. The Siegfried Lancet Prize, which has been established in 2018, commemorates the German-Jewish political scientist Siegfried Landshut, who was expelled from Hamburg and Germany by the Nazi regime in 1933, and who returned to Hamburg and to the University of Hamburg in the early 1950s in order to, among other things, rebuild and reconstruct the discipline of political science. The prize, however, is not intended to commemorate the exile or the suffering in exile of a particular person. Rather, the prize is awarded to recall the work of Siegfried Landshut, which, still unrecognized, has much to say to us today because of the often unconventional ways of his thinking and the interdisciplinary approach found there. Landshut's oeuvre is exemplary for us at the Hamburg Institute for Social Research in many respects. And quite logically, the Siegfried Landshut Prize was then also awarded to academics whose research we admire and to whom we want to give increased attention with the prize. In 2018, 2019, and 2020, these were the sociologists Michael Mann and George Steinmetz and the historian Isabel Hull. The 2021 prize is awarded today to French sociologist Marion Foucault, whose impressive work we wish to celebrate. We are pleased and feel very much honored that Senator Dr. Carsten Broster will, now one could say, as always, start the Lancet Prize ceremony by giving a welcome address. Professor Jens Beckert, when he arrives, hopefully, <laughs> the director of the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies in Cologne, will then give the laudatory speech for Marion Foucault, before Laura Wolters, a member of the research group on macroviolence here at the Institute, will say a few words about the content of the prize. Finally, of course, the laureate will speak on the topic of rationalized stratification. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, especially to Marion Foucault, that she is with us today. And I'm very glad and very grateful that Senator Carsten Broster will give a speech uh, according to the Lancet Prize. Professor Beckert is calling, it's better that somebody picks up the phone. But he's glad because he's hoping that I'll just do what politicians usually do, just talk for as long as I want to until <laughs> the guy who's actually giving one of the two key speeches of the evening is here. But <laughs> dear Professor Knöbel, dear Professor Foucault, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as you said, it's a as always sort of thing, but actually I think it still can be rather dangerous to allow politicians to speak at scholarly gatherings, uh, even if it's just to utter a few welcoming words. But uh, since the Siegfried Landshut Prize is named after a scholar who devoted his life to political science, one can, in the present context, see all this as an attempt to give a person whose activities are being scrutinized an opportunity to speak for themselves and to say what they think. And since you're not doing this for the first time, I'm I think you have all the reasons to expect that this will not be a complete and utter failure. But in the presence of this year's recipient, the situation is even more problematical and actually rather dangerous. For today, you are conferring the award to, on a sociologist who is working on data and their impact on social, cultural, and economic ordinal patterns. And on this occasion, you have invited along a cultural minister who finds the many trends towards standardization, measurement, and calculation in our society to be rather irksome. On the one hand, this is because of my own profession in terms of its own discursive practice, which is, of course, more based on argument than on analytical and empirical routines. And on the other hand, because cultural activities are concerned with meaning and aesthetics and thus with precisely those aspects of our lives and our creative work which are really not susceptible to being measured. And that is the reason 
why they are so valuable and why we all feel their value when we see it. A few days ago, I came across the works of Benny Bischoff, who transforms very simple graphic forms into precious objects with the help of picture descriptions. And he has some really nice works in the Kunsthalle in Liechtenstein. And I was particularly entranced by a series of three pictures on each of which one could only see one small red dot, a very small one. And the three picture descriptions were all the problems of the universe squeezed into one dot. And the second picture description was the longest line of the universe looked at from below. And the third one was My favorite one, actually, very great problem, a long, long way away. Here, with a few deft strokes of the brush, art once again clarifies connections between location and perspective, between types of measurement and the common assessment framework. Everyone in this room, if asked to say the same in thing in writing, would probably have ended up with several pages of text. So there it is. You have not only invited a politician to say something about science and scholarship, but you have in fact asked a cultural policymaker to talk about the technologically data-driven fixation of the age in which we live. And even if that is rather risky, it may in fact be a good idea after all. For we live in a world in which technology does more and more for us, and in which data seems to document everything which happens around the globe. In such a world, it makes sense to try to understand the many different kinds of technological data collection in particular and the way in which technology functions in general. Here we need artistic irritation and the opportunity to conduct a political discourse and, of course, sociological analysis. We still tend to make the mistake of looking at technology as an omnipotent way of solving problems. In fact, we think that technology is the solution for a problem and that obviates the need for further explanations. Sascha Friesecke and Johanna Spondel described this phenomenon rather well in an essay published last year. In the words of the two social scientists, it is an ominous fact that solutions are all too often sought not through technology, but within technology. And that is true. It is not the mere existence of a technically feasible solution that can overcome a problem. We can utilize the potential of technology only as a result of the intelligent application and transfer of technological mechanisms into our everyday activities. Time and again, digitization promises to give us solutions for all sorts of things. However, without understanding more about the problems that are waiting to be solved, it gives us nothing at all. So whoever wishes to utilize the technological possibilities of the digital age should be interested in how they are embedded in our daily lives in cultural and social terms. Those who do not do that will perhaps see the dot which represents the very great and far distant problem approaching quickly and in leaps and bounds. It is a strange feature of techno technological and above all of digital development processes that again and again we keep on wasting the time which is needed in order to prepare us for the introduction. This may have something to do with an unusual effect that another German politician and actually also a scientist Peter Glotz commented on in 1999 in his book on digitization Die Beschleunigte Gesellschaft, The Accelerated Society He pointed out that digital transformation processes usually take longer than originally anticipated. However, once they have been completed, the impact turns out to be far more profound and indeed far-reaching than initially promised. Yet instead of using the time thus gained in order to prepare for what lies ahead, time and again, we lose our belief in the advent of change at all. We say, well, it's not going to come. And then, in areas which are most affected, they are all the more surprised when it catches up with us as a disruptive force. Just think of the invention of the smartphone, the ones that are older in this room. We had approximately 10 years when people told us communication is going digital. 10 years. And there was a time when we believed, and when we had on our Nokia handies the first time something called WAP 
WAP, that this was supposed to be mobile communication. And then, 2007, the iPhone came, and we finally understood what was meant by mobile communication. Even the BlackBerry was just a mere small step on the way, but then it was there. But for 10 years, everybody was telling, it is going to come, and it's going to change everything, and there's going to be more computer power in it than the Apollo affair had when it landed on the moon, and all these things. But we somehow lost the vision that it was going to come, and then when it, once it was there, we were all too surprised to have not thought of any sort of regulatory framework and any idea what to do with this in a social way, and then looking what the Silicon Valley did with it. And something similar is now happening, actually, with regard to all those smart devices which are making such significant impact on our everyday lives. Right now, there are more smart devices sold day, year after year than there are sold tooth toothbrushes all over the world. And we have no idea what this actually means with our everyday life. And thir third example, not long ago, Nicolas Negroponte, who was head of the MIT in his book, on, uh, on digitization. He was programming with all the knowledge that he had. It is not going to be possible to digitize speech. There will be no way of doing any other language than Turkish by language pattern recognition, because that is the only language that had a change of the alphabet, and they had so basically the, the ideal uh, evaluation of the utterance and the symbol. And right now we are talking with Alexa and Siri like we never did anything else, and obviously what somebody told us 35 years ago isn't valued at all, because once again, it took longer, but it's far more profound in the end. Those who decide to carry out an ex-post analysis of the changes soon began to clamor for more transparency with regard to the operation and functioning of new gadgets and technologies in order to prevent that from happening. Yet it's not that simple. Friesik and Sprondl quite rightly point out in their essay that it is not enough to make something visible. It is a fallacy to believe that the publication of an algorithm, for example, will lead to better comprehension. The technologies are much too complicated, and thus it is also a fallacy to believe that publishing them will change the functioning of a platform, for example. We can subject our actions to critical scrutiny only when we understand what we are actually trying to do. The kind of transparency with which we are familiar does not lead to understanding. In particular, it does not help us a great deal and if and when it conceals more than it reveals. An example of this is that of the cookies which we are asked to accept or reject when we visit a website. In point of fact, the freedom of choice that this seems to suggest does not exist. No one reads the terms and conditions or the general data protection regulations of any of those websites that we are clicking on. Everyone more or less trusts the provider in order to be able to use the services. What else can we do when some of the terms and conditions have reached a stage where they have more words than Macbeth? That works because human beings are in fact rather complicated. And we sometimes do things which are rather bizarre. And one of the nicest examples, I think, is the one of Niels Bohr, who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics. And he was once asked why he, whether or not he believed in the horseshoe that was hanging over his front door. And the answer that he was giving at that point in time was, of course I don't. But you know, it has its uses even if one doesn't believe in it. And sort of like this it is with many things that we don't understand. But many modern technological applications display little or no interest in this complexity. Whereas we use them in a manner that is reminiscent of Bohr's horseshoe, many data-driven applications, on the other hand, reduce the human being to the status of something like a reflex amoeba, like a little tiny thing that just responds to a reflex in a specifically designed way. On the basis of the many digital footprints that we leave behind, Platforms and algorithms calculate how we may perhaps react to a specific offer. Stimulus response models, which, which matter our responses to a specific stimulus, are once again coming in favor due to this. We are moving into a world in which more and more aspects of our everyday life seem to, re due, seem to be reduced in an almost trivial way to the patterns of our digital footprints. A world that is, which does not insufficient justice to the logic inherent in machines and to the complexity of human consciousness and human behavior. 
And it just happens that sometimes we also believe in the power of a horseshoe. And that's human. We are fallible. We do things which cannot always be explained in rational terms. And this human touch is something we should try to protect and preserve. However, we will destroy it if we do not try to understand what technology, technology does to us in the long term as individuals and as a society over and over again. Behavior patterns tend to develop gradually and not in a disruptive manner, even if technology does. That is why we do not notice such changes immediately, but have a long time to adapt and have all these quabbles and discussions and discourses in our societies on how to deal with this. And ladies and gentlemen, if we do not wish to be transformed into beings that just react to stimuli, we need sociologists who point out the specifics of our individual and collective behavior to tell us what our capabilities are. They provide, and that is the crux of the matter, the kind of transparency which does not simply make things visible, but reveals the hidden relationships and enables us to understand what is going on. Trying to understand technology does not only mean trying to understand how algorithms work. It also means trying to understand what that signifies for our social coexistence and for the development of the state and of the economy. And that is what sociologists can explain to us. They are past masters of perceiving patterns and using them to interpret reality and to reduce it to some kind of order that we can understand. Marion Foucault is one of those scholars, and she decodes data to reveal their social impact. Thus, she reveals how categorization and organization processes evolved in the course of time. And she's not only interested in he recent history. In fact, she goes right back to the 19th century and elucidates the use and the significance of data and the transformation of the social order with reference to the banking sector, for example. Marion Foucault describes transformational and optimizing processes, and she talks about them in a remarkably comprehensible manner. And precisely because she makes these things so remarkably comprehensible, she is an excellent choice for the Siegfried Landshut Award. Siegfried Landshut also believed that political science should devote itself to the question of human coexistence. For this reason, he thought that it was a practical affair and that it could and should be applied in various different ways. And precisely that is what matters and always has mattered. In the middle of the last century, Max Horkheimer commented on the fact that instrumental reason was supplanting practical reason. What he was trying to say was that as a society, we were looking for reason in technology and not so much in human interaction. His successor, Jürgen Habermas, was the philosopher who in the 1970s stated that the major societal conflicts of our time existed on the borderline between instrumental reason on the one hand and communicative rationality on the other hand. And that the collisions of interest that were formerly designed to specifically social groups had been superseded by the struggle between those two logics of technological log logic on the one hand by power and by market economy and on the life world consensus on the other hand. Today, Technological mechanisms play a role in large areas of our everyday life. They make them observable and measurable. And to a certain extent, they facilitate the use of statistical models. The colonization of the world that Habermas talked about is by these technological means in our everyday life far more far-reaching than he could ever expect it when he wrote this in the 1970s talking about the the way that the state, for example, supplanted schools into the everyday life and said this is something that we have to do as a society. These mechanisms have often been described and they are clearly in full swing. Take, for example, Amazon's anticipatory shipping or predictive policing in some parts of the US, which are examples of the extent to which we now focus on means, that is to say, on data. This may sound harmless, when we compare it with China's social credit system, but then it all depends on the nature of what we are actually comparing, because the me mechanisms are the same. The use that we put them to are different. However, one thing is certain. A world in which every snippet of information is, is accessible, in which every action is supposed to be predictable, and in which the completely natural phenomenon of the unknown unknowns, our ignorance about things which we do not know, 
is minimized leads in the long run to a number of deficits. For example, the disappearance of those accidental occurrences which can turn our plans upside down. The disappearance of cognitive dissonance, of the ability to think of alternatives and of free will, because machines do the thinking for us, presumably, data seems to substantiate life as it is, and we no longer have to act in a responsible manner. And following on from this, the disappearance of empathy and of our conscience. Such a world is neither smart nor intelligent. Nor is it democratic, for in a democracy it is important to stand up not only for one's own interests, but also for those of other people, for things that you cannot measure on an individualistic level. My predecessor as a cultural senator in Hamburg always used to say, nicht alles was zählt kann man zählen, not everything that counts can be counted. And she meant this when we were talking about the budget of our ministry, but it applies to various uh, various occasions in life. And for this reason, I am delighted that today we are going to have the opportunity to look behind the technolo technological scenes, that thanks to sociological transparency, we are going to learn how to question our actions and indeed to change them. Because some problems may look small, but in the final analysis, that is only because they are still a long way away, which means that we have still time to look for a proper solution. Thank you so much for your attention. So we have to change the order of the program because Jens Beckert is not there still. We are st still hoping that he will arrive. So what we are doing right now, we changed the program. So we will now have a very specialized uh, talk by Marion Foucault. And then, very original actually, Jens Beckert will give us the wider framework <laughs> of Marion Foucault's oeuvre. So, uh, Marion Fougat, I'm glad that you are here. So, please come forward, and we are really looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. And uh, I am really, uh, and I'm standing here, by the way. If you haven't noticed, I am very petite. So this podium is actually too tall for me. So, <laughs> so I'm very uh, truly, truly honored and delighted to give uh, this lecture named after Siegfried Lanshut, a scholar of political ideas, and specifically of two of my intellectual heroes, Marx and Tocqueville, who are not often put together, actually. So it is a pity that I didn't get a chance to read Lanshut's work ahead of this event. I have heard enough about him to convince me that I should. My problem is that I learned German in school, and, but it, that was an embarrassingly long time ago. And so maybe I will turn to it in old age, or more likely, some of Lanzut's work will appear in translation. Incidentally, translations are one of the reasons, among many, why places like the Hamburger Institute play such a vital intellectual role. Professor Noble treated me earlier to the impressive collection of books to have come out of the Institute's presses recently. And on a more personal level, I feel very privileged that the Institute will publish a volume of my own work in German later this year. So I really want to express my gratitude to the scholars at the Institute and to Professor Noble, who collectively decided to honor me with this prize. And then, of course, I am deeply thankful to Senator Karsten Brosta uh, for his inspiring... I, I know, I feel I could actually just leave. You've had the lecture already. <laughs> uh, for his really uh, inspiring introduction to this event, and I look forward to uh, Jens Beckert's uh, laudatory speech. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. So, uh, let me now get to the lecture part. 
The pairing of massive data sets with processes that we call algorithms written in computer code has made inroads, as you know, in almost every major social institution. Today, techniques of mathematical optimization are routinely deployed in domains as varied as education, medicine, credit, insurance, criminal justice, and the public sphere in an effort to streamline and automatize processes of risk prediction, resource allocation, communication, and decision-making. Those are the main applications. These techniques are reorganizing markets, the state and society at large. In the sphere of the market, they create new classifications and forms of capital that structure people's life chances. In the sphere of the state, they transform the conditions of citizenship and political identification, as we just heard. And for society as a whole, they advance new forms of social organization, oriented toward and justified by measurement. So I'm writing a book with Kieran Healy at the moment um, that is called The Ordinal Society. That's the resulting social transformation that we see uh, coming. So what is the ordinal society? It is a society built on measurement and ranks. It is a set of institutions that strive to see and scale everyone by way of behavioral data harvested through digital environments. The institutions of the ordinal society have two essential characteristics. First, their ambition is exhausted. Everyone must be apprehended through numerical metrics and the categories they represent. And second, they are not merely interested in counting. Numbers, after all, are also and primarily ordering mechanisms. The ordinal society is primarily about classifying, sorting, and slotting those who come under its purview in an effort to manage individual claims on resources and opportunities in the case of the state or to extract value in the case of markets. Now, in many ways, none of this is new. That's this striving that animates the ordinal society is not new. Efforts to rationalize the process of measuring behavior and sorting people on that basis have a long history, in fact. The current growth and deepening reach of automated decision-making recalls, in fact, earlier forms of scoring by public and private institutions. When sociologist Max Weber discussed the step-by-step distributed and nominally objective procedures that characterized decision-making in modern bureaucracies, he was, after all, discussing a form of algorithm. One of Weber's key insights, of course, was that capitalist markets and bureaucratic organizations shared an affinity for the systematic application of rules and measures. People and things had to be visible if they were to be acted upon. In the 19th century American credit market, for instance, and also elsewhere, business guides developed methods to identify good credit prospects. Credit men went around town collecting various bits of information, gossip really, about the economic reliability of individuals and corporations. Hostesses sent undercover by the welcome wagon company to greet new families with neighborhood discounts and coupons actually discreetly gathered information about their character uh, through conversation and the visual inspection of their homes. Arbitrary as it often was, this data was used to create the impression of precision and order. Thank you. Around the country, dedicated organizations compiled and circulated local lists of businesses or individuals to subscribers, providing addresses and occupations along with numerically or pictographically coded information about their qualities as potential debtors. And you see uh, an example here from the credit guide. So through you know, these technologies, really written, techno bureaucratic written technologies, classes of people, scores and prices became closely connected. The emergence of life insurance follows a similar path. In the decades leading up to the U.S. Civil War, a few companies in the uh, U.S. South sold a strange product, life insurance contracts on slaves, 
based on simple calculations involving age and skill. Now, this is a, a useful reminder that um, capitalism, and you know, many of the institutions that we associated uh, with, uh, with capitalism were actually born on slave plantation, but that's a separate issue. Uh, from disreputable business, life insurance was progressively moralized to target middle-class households after the economic turmoil of the 1870s. In 1903, a doctor at the New York Life uh, Company started rating medical risks. This made it possible to personalize the price of life and health insurance through the application of a so-called numerical method. And then, as head of New York's largest life insurance company in the 1920s, the composer Charles Ives made it his business to turn life insurance scoring into an objective scientific operation. So this is where actually culture meets uh, you know, rationalized uh, metrics. So two things are worth mentioning. First, in the process of insuring themselves against risk, people learn to subject themselves to intrusive questioning about everything, their lifestyles, their ancestry, their health, giving away personal information for the convenience of a loan or the security of insurance became a normal thing. Second, even at, already at that time, and even more actually, corporations did not serve everyone equally or equally well. In the United States, black people were assumed to be less credit worthy on average. They were either excluded or burdened with less favorable uh, credit conditions as did women, as were women. But even then, the idea seemed irresistible that with more information, more numbers and more science, you know, we would have a promising past to expand the business toward new populations, including populations previously deemed unserviceable. Capitalism, let's remember, was flourishing, and the factory, too, was producing data, lots of it, in fact. In the 1910s, management pioneers Frank and Lillian Gilbreth used the best technology then available, film cameras, to observe and record the work process in order to understand its component parts and subject each of them to investigation and optimization. And then over at Purdue University, Dean Andre Abraham Potter developed a system for scoring students' character on loyalty, efficiency, and adaptability that formed the basis of his letter of evaluation to employers. And then finally, marketing. The collection of detailed information extended to consumers too, carried out by department stores and advertising firms. By the end of the 20th century, each person in America could be apprehended through a precise set of records in quantifiable form, drawn from a wide range of private sources, often supplemented by some nominally public information culled from public records. And of course, with the rise of computers, the construction of consumer profiles could now be done at scale. Credit reporting and consumer marketing converge. And now today they have fully converged because credit reporting agencies in the United States also have uh, all the, mar you know, are also marketing, um, for, you know, selling marketing data. Oscar Gandhi Jr., originally a specialist of marketing, was perhaps the most visionary American theorist of his generation and is not well known. As he defined it in the mid-1990s, quote, a profile is primarily a list of categories that have been determined to be relevant to some administrative decision that must be made by an organization with regard to an individual, a group, or a class. Individual categories or variables are the dimensions along which an entity may be evaluated. Subsets of categories may be combined into an index score. The fun and this is an important sentence. The fundamental purpose of a profile is the assignment of an individual into a class or category that represents a decision. This is a process of identification with a consequence. That was in the 1990s. 
But modern digital techniques work on similar principles. They just use more and more varied data, and the consequences are much more entangled with everyday life. The new profile or record is much more exhaustive than its predecessors. Its components are processed automatically. It circulates with much greater ease across institutions. It can be deployed for a much broader range of purposes, and it is customizable at will. Collecting data as a matter of course has become an expected performance, a cultural obligation for most organizations. We call this, with Karen Healy, we call this the data imperative. And of course, this data imperative stems partly from technological convenience. Falling costs of storage, software, and cloud computing, as well as weak consent laws, especially in the US, have pushed organizations of all st types to sweep up increasingly large quantities of bits about whatever crosses their path. For a few thousand dollars, any institution with an online presence can deploy a dragnet that collects granular data about people and things. It may do so passively from bits of information logged by digital devices loca located on one's person, like this one, and in the environment, or by actively enrolling individuals into the process through digital onboarding, obligatory check-in, rating, and so on. Also important is the institutionalized belief that more data and more technology will result in actionable knowledge. Right? We heard earlier that, you know, of course, this is not always true, but there is this belief that, you know, with enough data, you will gain that knowledge that you need. What kind of knowledge, for what purpose, may not be known. Future uses, indeed, are often unrelated to the reasons why the data was logged in the first place. And since new computing techniques have the ability to discover patterns with virtually no pre-established conceptions about the world, organizations, both public and private, are compelled to seek and demand new kinds of data so that they can essentially mine it, you know, to sort of bring out the patterns inductively and the knowledge inductively. That's the justification. They can be mined in a somewhat agnostic, agnostic fashion to find relations that stick. That's you know, what machine learning is about. <coughs> but we can understand the data imperative as a supply side mechanism too. To the extent that all essential social activities have moved partially online, being a full member of society implies once bit by bit incorporation into the networked infrastructure of the internet. Just as organizations are culturally obligated to collect more and more data, people are compelled to produce more and more data about themselves. Some of this incorporation appears coerced, but in many instances it isn't. In fact, people do it quite joyfully, expose themselves as Bernard Harcourt has written. Participating in digital systems promises access to new opportunities. Those who have been left behind will be able to train themselves. The financially excluded will muster, finally muster credit or funding. The jobless will find work. The entrepreneurial will innovate. Minorities will be empowered. Unknown artists and innovators will have a platform to showcase their creativity and so on. In other words, the tech industry's vision of the digital future is that of a gigantic inclusionary machine, a democratizing force, even a solution to problems of opportunity and fairness. And I'll get back to that. And in certain important ways, this vision you know, has some truth to it. But I want to get to the question of what does it translate to into concretely, you know, what, what, what is the, the other side of that promise? In practice, the main output of rationalized measurement systems is the proliferation of scores and classifications by way of algorithmic data processing, where algorithm can be a very simple set of instructions. In the market, the process typically yields some form of social differentiation. People are sorted into kinds and ranks, according to which they face different terms of service, 
a different product menu or different prices. So you can think of your Netflix categories as, you know, classification into kinds. And of course, you can think about credit scores, uh, in you know, for classification into ranks. And that's what society is about fundamentally, right? Society is about horizontal classification and vertical classification. Scores and ratings are of particular interest to us because they are about ordering people along some kind of hierarchy. And I think, you know, in your introduction, you were talking mostly about the, the segmentation, right? Which is the, 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 the classification in the, into kind, what I call nominal classification. And here I'm going to talk mostly about the ordinal aspects of it, that is the, the relationship of these systems to a social stratification system. In this system, social positions are defined in relation to thresholds and cut points on ordinal or cardinal scales. People may be treated as prime or subprime risks. One's job continuation as a platform worker may depend on a proprietary rating that matches cumulative feedback by clients with other measures of efficiency and profitability for the website. Now, sociology offers a number of theoretical tools for thinking about the mechanisms by which inequality is produced and maintained. So in the next uh, you know, section of this talk, I will show how um, Healy and I have repurposed these tools to account for the stratifying processes that emerge from the proliferation of uh, and the deployment of behavioral measurement systems. We can call the resulting perspective rationalized ratification, hence the title. So to preface, the, to preface our argument, uh, you know, what we find is that newly actionable social divisions, forms of capital and social duties are being produced, all of which shape people's life trajectories in multiple ways. So I'll begin with a number, you know, I'll present a number of concepts that uh, we've been working with. Uh, and the first one actually relates to uh, the literature, you know, to a classic concept on, in the literature on inequality, the concept of social class. The question is, you know, how may we think about class in the era of behavioral me measurement? So I will mention Weber again, because Weber defines social class as arising when, quote, you all know this, of course, a number of people have in common a specific causal component of their life chances. Unlike Marx, who thought about class in terms of an ex-ante positional binary, owning or not owning the means of production, with the notion of life chances, Weber argued that the process of class assignment was made real ex post, depending on the actual outcomes of sorting processes happening in the rationally organized market. Class situation, he said, is ultimately market situation. And this allowed him to have a much more expansive view and consider various relevant markets for class formation. In fact, he talked about the credit market in addition to the labor market as a possible site of class formation. Today, these class or market situations are rooted in behavioral data made legible through computer code. They are dynamic constantly readjusting to the institution's objectives and incoming data flows. To mark the qualitative shift from Weber's time, we let us call them classification situations as opposed to class situation. Classification situations in multiple domains, and I have represented a bunch of them here, structure broad opportunities and life chances. The likelihood of obtaining or staying in a job of, of obtaining credit, of being able to rent an apartment, even being deemed a desirable uh, dating prospect depends on these techniques of scoring and ranking people. In, so people's situation in various markets increasingly depends on these organizational efforts to identify them as members of some category, to offer prices, services, or other opportunities on the basis of that membership and to reconfigure both the criteria for class membership and the overall system of categories in the effort to maximize returns. And of course, people care deeply about how they fare in these systems. 
they orient themselves towards this chaos and adjust their behavior so they can make it there too. Examples abound. You can think, for instance, about the relentless efforts of those who depend on platforms for work to maintain a high rating or boost their number of followers. You know, there are several books um, uh, about influencers, right? So you have um, Brooke Duffy has written about women influencers. Forrest Stewart has written about real artists who try to make it on YouTube and so on. You can think also of the sprawling advice industry that helps people manage and improve their credit score, a subject studied by sociologist Fred Wary. It is important to understand that classification situations are not merely approximations to pre-existing social groups, racial groups or cl previous classes, right? Though, of course, they may overlap with them. Uh, I'll return to this. But rather, we need to think about them as independently generated taxonomies and scales that can come to have distinctive and consequential effects on the outcomes people experience in life. Let me now turn to a second concept, also well known in the literature on social stratification, the concept of capital. Karen Healy and I have argued in a separate paper that we can think of the totality of one's interactions with the digital economy as a metaform of capital in the sense of Pierre Bourdieu. Conceived in a generic manner, Capital for Bourdieu is an embodied set of resources that profits its bearer, allowing them to fit naturally into the dominant group, however you want to define that group, the cultured, the wealthy, you know, the socially influential. And for Bourdieu, capital comes in several primary forms. The main ones are economic, cultural, social, and symbolic. The new type of capital that we should be conceptualizing today overlaps with the traditional forms identified by Bourdieu, but also departs from them. Like cultural capital, it is accumulated over the long run of a person's life. It is the sedimented history of their recorded actions built up from traces left on everything from social media to credit bureau, shopping websites, fidelity programs, courthouses, pharmacies, and the content of emails and chats. It incorporates social ties, much like social capital, and it implies moral worth, much like symbolic capital. But unlike Bourdieuian forms, it has a much clearer materiality. Its digital nature makes it a subject for calculation. It may be difficult to wrap one's head around what we mean con concretely, so let me try to explain. Fundamentally, this capital should be thought of as a set of vectors in a multi-dimensional space where each dimension is measured. To fully grasp this character, we call it eigencapital, where the eigen, in, you know, like in eigenvector or eigenfunction, means characteristic or proper. Now, of course, I know that this may cause some confusion in German. <laughs> Because eigencapital with a K is a financial term that refers to equity or any capital that is raised through selling shares. And um, we tried hard to find another term, but we really thought that eigencapital captured exactly what we wanted to say. And then we also realized that that metaphor even with the German meaning, is actually appealing. As people come to relate to their own data as a form of property that can be capitalized upon, even sold, the specific meaning of the eponymous German concept actually deepens the, you know, the usefulness of the concept. Um, so how do we think about eigencapital? Let me try to give you an example. If you think of a single row of the data, characterizing, for instance, a datafied Marion Fourcade. Each column would be a measure of something, and collection, collections of columns would come from different sources and capture different features of Marion Fourcade and her profile. The imaginary eigencapital would, at the individual level, be some way of boiling all of that information down to some reduced characterization of who I am in terms of a few key measures. What those measures are would vary by the purpose pursued 
by whichever organization decides to deploy it. So from the actual Marion forecast point of view, the various scores calculable from this data would inevitably lose detail or be inaccurate in various ways, which we heard about earlier. But from the point of view of the organization that collects that, that would be a good enough summary of where I fit relative to other people, right? And maybe in fact, in practice for everyday life, that might be good enough for me too. Now, of course, we should not uh, forget that in practice, eigen capital is a real engineering problem. Um, and it is subject to failure, it is subject to incomplete realization. But precisely because of this, you know, we see a drive to constantly enhance its materiality and its numerical character and to make it more tractable through techniques of dimensionality reduction. So at one extreme, in fact, Eigen capital may take a highly reduced form as a single number or rating. The various attempts in China to develop private or public social credit systems strive, in fact, towards such a unitary concept by scoring citizens on a composite index from data collecting, collected through a broad range of systems. But we often forget that eigen capital is being realized in the West too, in this also in this very crass, very reduced form. It is often associated with efforts to exclude from services people who are deemed untruthful or deviant. For instance, the company Airbnb, which already uses renters' credit scores to rate them, has recently filed a patent for developing a quote trustworthiness score. Uh, note that Facebook has been doing this for several years already in a different context. According to the patent, quote, text authored by the person or that provides information about the person, end quote, can be used to indicate that they, among others, have provided false or misleading information, are involved with drugs, alcohol, hate, hate, hate websites, sex work, civil litigation, or pornography have authored online content with negative language, or, my favorite, have interests that indicate negative personality or behavior traits. What this case describes is a form of eigencapital to be bestowed on people algorithmically and across domains, often in a manner that is very opaque, not only to them, actually, but often to the engineers who design these systems. To the extent that it works successfully, and it's important to bear in mind that getting these technologies to work is a huge challenge, the process actually will fade completely into the background. You will not see the bad actors who try to use your card, but were automatically denied. You do not have your integrity questioned by a sales clerk or border patrol agent. The system smoothes the way by seamlessly authenticating you and authorizing you. The fortunate and the virtuous by the system standard actually experience the outcome as a well-deserved kind of ease and they don't think about it twice. But those who try to evade being measured and classified, as well as those who perform uh, poorly, face of course high costs, undesirable matches, and increasingly outright exclusion as in various forms of deplatformization. As an example, Uber's, uh, the, the company Uber, uh, new terms of service, which I signed about uh, two months ago, now specify, quote, any user whose rating falls below a certain threshold can lose access to their account. So where the, whereas the uh, company's initial innovation was the rating of drivers, it is now doing the same for passengers. I mean, it's actually been doing the same for a long time, but now it is in the open, it's visible. And it is using ratings to manage the order flows and prices so that the highly rated are matched with each other, driver and passengers, um, and face better terms overall. So this brings me to a third topic, citizenship. That is the right to belong to some place or institution. 
forms of eigencapital, however incomplete and ad hoc, are in fact increasingly connected to the extension of rights, what political theorists call citizenship. In fact, let's go back a little bit too. We often forget that there is a direct link between what British sociologist T.H. Marshall called social citizenship and modern regimes of personal data collection. It is in fact, uh, and Sarah Igo has written about this, the expen and Dan Daniel Book as well, the expansion of the welfare state that spearheaded government's interest in the constitution of detailed individual records. In the United States, the social security system started maintaining longitudinal files over a person's lifetime that were modeled after practices in the corporate life insurance industry. Today, personal surveillance inheres in the provision of public supports and algorithms have burrowed their way into various kinds of social policies, as Virginia Eubanks has described in her remarkable book, Automating Inequality. It is not unusual for public institutions to require intrusive pre-qualifying information and obligate claimants to frequent checks into their digital ecosystems. Digitization has led to the proliferation of quantitative measures and point systems in the management of social citizenship. So just an example, Australia's welfare recipients who, quote, fail to meet their required activities receive, quote, demerit points that put them at risk of income support suspension. Uh, and, you know, the required activities often are about, you know, you might think that they are serious activities, but often they are about sort of checking in, you know, frequently into the system, which for certain categories of people can be actually a challenge for various, you know, social and, um, re and technological reasons. Second, once data has been obtained, it can be shared across agencies and be repurposed to pursue organizational goals, for instance, cost saving, that may conflict with the original mission. Many scholars, in fact, have noted that these functional changes have gone hand in hand with a broader ideological transformation of social citizenship from an unconditional status motivated by shared fate to a contingent privilege dependent on personal worth. So, to sum up, I have argued that rationalized measurement systems should be thought about as new and consequential dimensions of social stratification for three reasons. First, they shape opportunities within the various domains in which they arise, and sometimes across domains. For instance, the credit score can be used, you know, to rent an apartment or um, to date or to... <laughs> you know, to obtain a job. Second, combined all together, these classification situations constitute a new overarching form of capital that represents the general social position that an individual obtains by virtue of their incorporation into the digital economy. And in practice, we have seen various efforts, both East and West, to reduce this eigencapital to a number that represents an individual's general goodness or honesty or trustworthiness or reputation, however you want to call it. And then finally, these measures and others like them can become a linchpin for determining the conditions of citizenship in various market and state-based institutions. One, I think we have our... <laughs> Jens Becker. One important question remains. How do these systems interact with other well-established patterns of inequality, such as gender or race or both? The power of rationalized measurement systems at root is their ability to draw on a very large volume of data about the things that people do. So let me use credit score as an example. So that's the final question, which uh, you could call intersectionality. Credit scores are rooted in detailed records about credit behavior. Payment made, payments made on time without exceeding the credit limit. You can see on this slide the components of the US credit score, the credit history, and the type of credits used, um, 
you know, how much uh, credit uh, are you uh, demanding at the moment, how much do you owe, and your payment history. And you can see also the component of the German Schufa, which is quite uh, similar. Um, the Schufa school. Hello, Jens Beckett. <laughs> Scoring agencies, it's important, and you can see that actually in the, you know, on the Shufa uh, um, uh, screenshot here. Um, do not use demographic information in the calculation of credit scores. The closest to a standard demographic variable is length of credit history, which is a good proxy for age. Information about salary, job title, employer, employment history, place of residence in the U.S. are also excluded from consideration. Interest rates on particular credit cards, charge report obligations, and rental agreement obligations are also excluded. So the result is a score that seems stripped of all categorical markers, a pure measure of past behavior predictive of future credit risk. Behind the veil of categorical differences, occupational status, income, or wealth are simply the actions that people have taken with whatever money they had. Personalized scoring systems seemingly isolate a pure individual contribution, disentangled from one's economic situation and social status. But as an exhaustive empirical literature has shown, the idea of a pure individual component fully extricated from the broader social structure by way of more and more data is a mirage. Because social behavior differs reliably across demographic categories, men versus women, you know, black people versus white people, scores rooted in behavioral data will also differ reliably across categories. Consequently, these systems' efforts to determine individual deservingness are thus likely to propel well-known structural inequalities into the future. So this kind of disentanglement is not really possible. And of course, well, as sociologists, we know that, right? But that is always the dream, that with more and more individual data, you will get to this pure sort of personality component, you know. Um, the few empirical studies that have worked with proprietary credit data, and it's a whole challenge to get that data. And there's a well-known study uh, by the Federal Reserve. Kieran and I have re worked with self-reported credit data, and there's a new paper that just came out uh, by a, a number of economists uh, in the Journal of Finance that also shows the same thing, that net of all traditional controls, racial differences in credit behavior continue to be large. At practically every level of income, non-whites in the United States are more likely to pay only the minimum on a credit card bill, to pay a late fee, and to exceed their credit limit than, uh, than whites. So these results in much lower credit scores on average, everything else being equal. So how should we think about this? As a well-measured but problematic group behavior, or should we think about it as a result of unmeasurable historical legacies of suffering, exclusion, and socialization that are now stuffed and rendered invisible through the credit score behavioral channel? And of course, every rationalized behavioral measurement system, you know, think of the healthcare system, insurance, and so on, faces exactly the same problem. Okay, so I'll conclude with a few thoughts about the problems I see with the ordinal society and ordinality uh, more generally. And please do not misunderstand me, because there are plenty of advantages to behavioral scores and ratings. They make institutions work faster and more efficiently, they perform a certain idea of objectivity and depoliticize contentious social processes. But we can still pose three really important questions. The first uh, question, first problem, is what we may call the illusion of order. In the words of Fabien Cominotti, scoring systems benefit from 
quote, an aura of full precision that conceals the fuzziness, messiness, ambiguity, and multidimensionality of the evidence behind the constructs they claim to measure. More importantly, scores elevate an ideal of social orderliness, and they sustain the belief that scaling people is a natural, good, and legitimate thing to do. And there is, in fact, a lot of empirical evidence, some of it produced by a community himself, that, in fact, people are more likely to accept inequality if it relies on artificially sharp and clear-cut measures than other types of comparative assessment. So if you give people, you know, sort of narrative evaluations, um, they are much less likely to accept inequality than if you say you're four and you're five. Then somehow it has a finality. Um, so one of the most important things about scoring from this point of view is quite simply the fact that it forces us to see the social world as a space of commensurability and thus hierarchization. But we may want to ask ourselves the question, how do we sustain beliefs in equality in a system that is obsessed by the measurement of difference? The second problem uh, I would call the problem of merit. As I just discussed with the example of credit scores, the behaviorism embedded in rationalized measurement systems ha also has a moral dimension. So by appearing as records of prior actions and decisions, scores seem to imply that anyone who applies themselves can do well, since everyone is, you know, covered, everyone is seen, everyone is legible. So you just need to apply yourself and you will, you know, your score, you, you, your score will improve. But of course that obfuscates the broader social forces that shape the very context in which not only individual actions take place, but individuals themselves have been built, right, have been constituted, the socialization. Positions are experienced as morally deserved as the competitive outcome of prior good or bad individual actions and decisions, or worse, as the outcome of some innate character. And of course, this idea that performance scores legitimate the social order by producing scales of deservingness is an old critique. You can find it in the old sociology of education in the 1960s, right? Um, and John Meyer, you know, wrote in an earlier paper um, that social theory is obsessed with the distinction between just and functional inequalities and unjust and power-ridden ones. And this is exactly what these kinds of uh, systems are trying to do without, of course, fully succeeding. So that brings us to a second question. If unequal outcomes are deemed to be just, how do we maintain meaningful forms of solidarity? And then finally, we must consider the fact that much algorithmic sorting is oriented to the needs of specific organizational objectives. This is why, for instance, there isn't one credit score, at least in the US, but thousands, each precisely tailored to the particular economic purpose it is meant to serve, or why many ordinal systems for instance, rating systems uh, on uh, la online labor platforms tend to reward better people who produce value for the platforms. So it's not simply the people who do well the jobs that they are taking, but it's the people who take more jobs, who work longer hours. That's what the value, of course, the platform is interested in. So what we see is that the same data that powers evaluations of relative merit also serves to optimize on market value. Uh, at its worst, this may mean evaluating someone's likelihood of being tempted by a particularly rotten deal, their willingness to accept a particularly low salary, or the risk that they will leave the company or will become a burden on social services. You know, once the data is there, why not? Um, so at its best, what this means is that people, people's movement up and down some ordinal scale may have little to do with their own actions 
and everything to do with changing system rules and incentives. And we've seen that actually um, after the financial crisis, where suddenly, you know, credit scores, uh, you know, the basis for credit scores was changed, and you had entire groups of people who saw their credit, you know, rise or, or, or fall through. Uh, uh, structural elements that had nothing to do with their own behavior and everything to do with what the bank's um, new rules were. So what we see here is that ordinal stratifications are culturally powered and naturalized by ideologies of merit, but in fact they remain anchored by considerations of market value. And in fact, you know, Friedrich Hayek saw the two as more or less equivalent, mer you know, merit and market value. So I will leave you with my third question. If merit is just a small screen for institutional profit or institutional value, then scores are fundamentally distributional matters that must be returned where they belong. They must be returned to the realm of politics. So I'll leave you with that thought, and I thank you for listening. So thank you, Mario Foucault, for this wonderful talk. Uh, before Jens Beckert will enter the stage, let me say at least two sentences. First of all, Jens Beckert, the director of the Max Planck Institute for the, for the Study of Societies in Cologne, has become famous for many, many things, not least for coining the term fictional expectations. Uh, and I give you an example. Maybe you believe that you know the train will arrive in time, but of course this is an expectation, but it's often just a fictional expectation. So that's basically the reason why he was late. And let me add one more sentence. Um, Jens Beckert also revolutionised thinking, action theoretical thinking uh, within economic sociology by introducing also the term of creative action. Now, this is basically very important for this event tonight because we have the strange situation that we have the laudatio after the speech. So, Jens Becker, thank you very much for coming. Despite of all these delays, I'm looking forward for this strange kind of laudatio, but I'm sure you will make it brilliantly. Yeah, Th thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. Yeah, I, I think we should learn to, to read train schedules as a new form of the genre of fictional texts. Uh, that is probably. Uh, nevertheless, it is, it is my great pleasure to, to be here and, uh, and to give this laudatio for, for my old friend uh, Marion. Uh, I think we know since since more than 20 years, uh, probably, and share long parts of our uh, of our biographies in in intellectual in intellectual terms. And so, so it is my pleasure uh, to be here, and I'm happy I made it. At least, uh, I mean. At least, at least, although I disturbed the choreography, the planned choreography of this of this event. So with the naming of, of an award, an institution makes a statement about its own identity. The person after whom the award is named is seen as representing important qualities that also figure as orientation markers for the identity of the institution. The Hamburger Institut für Sozialforschung cre created the Siegfried Landshut Prize to honor researchers who understand social phenomena in the historical unfolding, who take a comparative and interdisciplinary approach, and who take theoretical questions as the starting point for their empirical investigations. All these qualities are associated with the name of Siegfried Landshut. They are also associated with the work of this year's awardee of the Siegfried Landshut Award, Professor Marion Foucault. 
Naming an award after a person also reflects the wish of the institution that the respect for this person will increase the regard for the award and the institution itself. The value of the person after whom the award is named is transferred to the institution and it's intended to contribute to its status. Awards are sociological phenomena. They are also sociological phenomena with regard to the award D. Academic awards are given to highly respected researchers in their fields. The status of the award depends not only on the monetary value it has and the institution that grants it, but it also depends on the recipients of the prize. Who has already received the award? The more respected the recipients are, the more valuable the prize. This value creation by association holds for the institution awarding the prize and for the recipients whose prestige is increased by receiving an award that has a history of previous award winners. With Michael Mann, George Steinmetz and Isabel Hall, three eminent social scientists have received the Siegfried Landshut Award. The interaction between the social status of the awardees and the status of the award itself contributes to what Robert Merton has famously called the Matthew effect. Seen as markets, awards are winner-take-all markets where having received an award strongly increases the likelihood of receiving another award in the future. <laughs> awards are sociological phenomena in still other dimensions. They are the presenters of the laudatio and of welcome addresses, among whose task it is making the institution giving the award and the person receiving it appear in the best possible light. The status of these speakers also contributes to the appreciation of the prize, and at least a little bit it elevates the status of the speakers to be selected for this role. Finally, there is the audience at the award ceremony who participates in the award ceremony also influences the value of the award. Vice versa, it is status confirming for the audience to be part of the ceremony. Academic awards, like the Siegfried Landshut Prize, are valuation devices. I point this out not to make any of you uncomfortable, but because one of the main research topics of Marion Foucault, the recipient of this year's award, is the topic of valuation. Marion Foucault's research does not focus on academic awards, but she is one of the most influential contributors to recent debates on valuation and classification in the social sciences. Given her expertise in studying valuation processes, the mechanism underlying academic awards are certainly no stranger to her. Value, one can summarize this research in one sentence, is not a natural phenomenon that can be located by inspecting the object but it is a social spectacle. Value emerges and becomes reinforced in intersubjective processes of recognition and classification. One of the fields in which Marion Foucault has studied the social constitution of value is oil spills. Again and again, Super tankers transporting up to half a million tons of oil across the world sink in storms or due to technical failure and contaminate the sea and close by shorelines in devastating ways. Oil spills damage nature and the owners of oil tankers are seen as being liable to compensate for the damage. But what is the damage? 
Is it the economic loss for fishermen and the tourist industry in the area? Is it the fauna and flora itself that has a right to be compensated for its loss of life? Is it the money it costs to reinstate the former state of the natural habitat? How do we measure all this and on what scale? In 1978, the oil tanker Amoco Cadiz sank off the coast of Brittany, spilling an estimated 220,000 tons of oil, which was in large parts washed ashore. In 1989, the supertanker Exxon Valdez ran aground in the Prince William Sound in Alaska, spilling 40,000 tons of oil. In the lawsuits that followed, it was finally decided that the owners of the Amaco Cadiz had to pay $200 million in damage compensation. The total costs for the owners of the Exxon Valdez were by contrast roughly $4 billion. In one case, the compensation per ton of oil spilled was a little more than $900. In the other case, it was $100,000. Mario Foucault asked in an impressive research project, why was the spilling of oil in Alaska so much more expensive for the polluter compared to the oil spill in French waters? How was the value of the damage assessed? And why was it assessed so differently? As Mario Foucault shows, the differences can be traced back not only to the different legal systems in which the litigation took place, the US and France, but especially to the different ways of valuing nature or the destruction of it in the two countries. To put a price on the destruction of nature is an almost impossible task. There is no market value for the destruction of the nature of Prince William Sound. It implies making two incommensurable things, nature and money, commensurable. The American courts took recourse to a valuation method called contingent valuation where a representative group of Americans were asked in a survey how much they would be willing to pay to be able to visit the intact nature of the Prince William Sound. From this, the damage was calculated in economic terms. Americans, on average, put a value of $31 on the possibility of visiting the Sound. In France, by contrast, Putting a price tag on the destruction of nature was seen by the state and by environmental groups alike as being deeply problematic. Expressing the value of nature in monetary terms was seen as a sacrilege, as crossing the boundary between the sacred and the profane. Nature has no price. The value of nature was seen as incommensurable to an economic scale, making it much more difficult to pursue economic claims in court against the owners of the ship. Moreover, long-term political disputes between Brittany and the central government in Paris made common political action difficult. Value. Marion Foucault's research shows is the result of social, political, and cultural processes and the instruments being used for valuation through which an object is classified. Foucault's work on oil spills exemplifies important traits that characterize her work more generally. First of all, Marion Foucault is a comparativist. She holds the strong conviction that to understand social phenomena, it is important to compare them across settings to recognize their uniqueness 
and their anchoring in cultural, institutional, and historical specificities. Marion Foucault is also a historical sociologist. She believes that we can only understand social phenomena if we see them in the context of their historical emergence. She's at the same time not a historian. Her interest is not primarily in understanding single events in history, but she's interested in a present that can only be understood by investigating its coming into being in the course of the long durée of historical processes. Finally, Marion Foucault is what one may call an empirical theorist. Her work is characterized by the strong belief in the continued relevance of the sociological classics, the significance of basic concepts and distinctions that are often 100 years old, but that sociologists can still use productively as lenses through which to look at phenomena in, large, in a large range of contexts and periods. Marion Foucault is not an abstract theorist interested in concepts and schemes for their own sake, but she makes use of concepts, develops them further, and applies them to understand relevant and puzzling empirical phenomena. In her approach, she might be compared most closely to Pierre Bourdieu, whose work also treated theory and empirics as inseparably. <gasps> Comparativist, historical, and theory advancing, these are three traits of the work of Marion Foucault. They should be, in my opinion, the hallmarks of any sociologist. Looking at the work of the Hamburg Institute for Sozialforschung, intends to honor with the Siegfried Lanzot Award, Marion Foucault is certainly an ideal recipient of it. It is no secret that only small parts of today's sociology is actually characterized by these features. To have studied first in France, a country that still gives importance to philosophy and the training of social scientists may have shaped the foundational convictions of Marion's work. But Marion Foucault is not simply a French sociologist. In her graduate training at Harvard, she learned that sociology is ultimately an empirical discipline and needs methodological rigor. Her approach to sociology shows a deep imprint from both French and American sociology, a combination of Europe and America that characterizes many of the best sociologists since the 1940s. The Berkeley Sociology Department, where Marion Foucault was appointed in 2003, is one of the prime locations where this combination of intellectual traditions has a long history. Marion Foucault's work on valuation and oil spills is part of her larger interest in categories and classification. And I believe the presentation you just gave was exactly <laughs> on this. Introduced into sociology in the early 20th century by Emil Durkheim and Marcel Mauss in their path-breaking essay on primitive classifications, Categories and classifications of social entities are probably the most powerful devices to structure and stratify societies. The sacred and the profane, right and wrong, black and white, male and female, German and French, Ivy League or non-Ivy League, triple A or non-investment grade. Categories and classifications are powerful social devices that structure social life, order it, create boundary, boundaries, and constitute what Charles Tilly called durable inequalities. Just think of another research project of Marion, this one on the wine market in Burgundy. For an economic sociologist, 
Wine is a fascinating research topic. I worked on wine myself. <laughs> yeah. for, for an economic sociologist, wine is a fascinating research topic, not primarily because of its capacity for physical intoxication, but because it can also be intellectually intoxicating. How can consumers distinguish the quality of wine given that there are tens of thousands of different wines being sold on the market. Prices neither reflect production costs nor the sensual experiences from drinking it. Order in the wine market is created through classification systems that reduce the opaqueness of the market to the consumer but also create entrenched profit niches for some producers by marginalizing others. The best known classification system in the wine market is the premier cru system of the Bordeaux region. Introduced by the state and wine merchants before the Parisian World Exhibition of 1855, the system designated five chateaux as producing premier cru wines a classification that has not changed to this day, but for two exceptions. In 1855, it was the most expensive wines from Bordeaux region, which received the Premier Cru label, not the best, according to a wine tasting. But the classification was read by consumers, and this was intended as a quality label, thus allowing for entrenching the high prices and the hierarchical ordering of wine producers and the profits they make. The classification system in Burgundy that Marion Foucault investigated has much older historical roots, going back to the Middle Ages, and was also distinctively political, classifying very specific terroirs as producing the highest quality of wine and limiting the use of certain grape varieties produced the valuation system that the wine connoisseurs of today still take for granted, but whose historical and political origins they are mostly unaware of. This historical entrenchment is part of the power that classifications have, and power itself contributed to putting the classification systems in place. Starting from concepts that originated with the classics of sociology allows Marion Foucault to address a broad range of empirical topics, showing surprising simil similarities in mechanisms of creating social order and social inequalities across empirical domains. Marion Foucault is not specializing in one topic that reappears in different forms throughout her career. The theoretical questions she is interested in and which are probed in different empirical fields are the thread running through her work. Being so strongly interested in questions of, of classification, categorization and boundary making, and at the same time living in geographic proximity to Silicon Valley, it is no coincidence that digital technologies became another research topic for Professor Foucault in recent years, and that was part of this presentation she just gave. This new research focus is reflected in empirical research projects in which she investigated scoring systems in the credit economy and digital tracking devices and their relevance for social stratification processes. In their operation, Markets increasingly rely on the classification of consumers according to scoring systems. The new technologies provide opportunities for firms to structure and price offerings to consumers individually or to exclude certain consumer groups based on risk assessments. Classifying consumers and creditors according to risk and presumed preferences is per se nothing new in markets but the depth this gains with digital technology is. Classification situations, as she calls it, multiply and are more consequential 
for the distribution of life chances and the development of social inequalities in the digital age. The strong focus on classification and categorization shows Marion Foucault as a sociologist of knowledge. How we organize knowledge or how we think is profoundly shaped by society, something that, again, especially Emil Durkheim showed primarily in his work on religion. The sociology of knowledge perspective characterizes Manuel Foucault's important monograph on the discipline of economics, entitled Economics and Societies. Sociologists have made processes of scientific discovery and the organization of knowledge regimes a topic of investigation, at least since the 1940s. In the 1980s, this interest became stronger with the type of laboratory studies that were pioneered by Bruno Latour in France and Karin Knossetina in Germany. Later, this perspective was also applied to the investigation of financial markets, constituting the sociology of finance as a subdiscipline. But the perspective was also used to investigate the knowledge-making processes in economics, <laughs> constituting the subfield of a sociology of economics. Marion Foucault was a pioneer in this field with her dissertation on the development of the profession of economics since the 19th century in a comparative study of France, England, and the United States. Econom Economists and Societies is a much acclaimed book which won, among several other prizes, the award for best book of the American Sociological Association in 2011. Economists and Societies investigates from a historical perspective the institutions of the economics profession in the three countries and the intellectual content of the knowledge produced. Economics developed differently in the three countries due to its embeddedness in different cultural and institutional structures. Far from being a science that is independent of time and space. <laughs> Economics as a discipline cannot be thought of independent of the societies in which it is produced. Economists and society uses a mixture of archival resources, books by economists, and interviews with present-day actors. The book is an extraordinarily ambitious project which earned Professor Foucault respect and admiration within the discipline of sociology, but also among economists. Working on classifications does not prevent one from being classified oneself. <laughs> By awarding the Siegfried Landshut Award to Marion Foucault, the Hamburger Institute for Sozialforschung honors one of the most creative sociologists of her generation, who has the rare ability to identify highly original and relevant research questions and embarks on innovative empirical fields to study them. I can only wish that the recognition of Marion Foucault's value will continue. We need more sociologists of Marion Foucault's type for the discipline of sociology to prosper and to develop the potential that was so fruitfully first laid out 100 years ago by the founders of the discipline. Thank you. So, um, it seems to me we have one more or one last thing left to do tonight, which is actually giving out the prize. And um, it falls to me, and I will do this very brief to uh, explain to you what it contends. As we have already heard, the Lanzhut Prize was founded to honor remarkable scholars and acknowledge their respective works, thoughts, and ideas. And in this wonderful laudation, we have already seen why Marion Foucault is more than a deserving laureate this year, 
whose contributions to academia merit awarding. And since you've already heard her herself, I think this is very clear and you don't need any more convincing. Um, as Jens Becker already gave away, giving out an award is never without ulterior motives. I won't try to deny that. <laughs> Instead, I will just add one more. We always wanted the Lanzut Prize to not only look to the past, meaning honoring past contributions, but also to look to the future, to start a conversation that can help and inspire today's or tomorrow's research and today's or tomorrow's young researchers. For this reason, the Lanzwood Prize includes that we ask of our awardees to name two promising young scholars who the Hamburg Institute will then invite as fellows, covering their costs. These two will get the opportunity for an extended stay in Hamburg and to participate in the Institute's discussions and research. Marion Foucault has gladly made her choice, and as a researcher here at the Institute, it is my pleasure to very briefly introduce this year's two scholarship holders. The first fellow is Shannon Ikebe, a sociologist from the University of California at Berkeley, who focuses on the history of social democracy and labor movements in Europe. Right now, he is in the process of filing his PhD thesis on Swedish political attempts to expropriate private property and to transform it into common property. The second fellow chosen by Marion Foucault is Byron Milassis, a social science researcher also from Berkeley, who is interested in the connections between sociology, demography, and economics. He just recently finished his PhD, in which he focused on the role of quantifications in societies and in quantitative methodologies in social science. A topic he also knows from very well from practice, since he has been the general director of the National Institute of Statistics and Censuses in Ecuador for five years. We, the researchers of the HIS, are very much looking forward to welcome Shannon Ikebe and Byron Velasquez here in Hamburg in the future, as we are happy to welcome Marion Foucault right now. We are really glad to have you. Thanks for coming. So we are almost at the end of the ceremony, so I would like to come forward to Jens Beckert, Mario Foucault, and Carsten Broster, because we will have a picture right now. We are not handing over flowers to Marion, because she's traveling a lot, <laughs> and therefore flowers wouldn't be appropriate. So we decided on a pencil in which the price and the name of Marion Foucault is engraved. So please come forward, all three of you, and I will so this is actually the not very apt for a photograph from the <laughs> but still. So congratulations. <laughs> Once again, I would like to thank all of those involved. First and foremost, of course, Marion Foucault for a wonderful lecture, the active contributors to this award ceremony, Carsten Broster, Jens Beckert, Lara Wolters, and all the helping hands in the background who made this possible. And of course, a thank you to all the viewers for watching. I would like to close with the announcement of a second lecture by Marion on Wednesday at the same time, that is 7 p.m., I hope 7 p.m. And again, here at the HIS and at the same time via YouTube, she will give another lecture, which we are very much looking forward to, then a lecture on the topic of the type and the grade in which alcoholic beverages, or to be more precise, wine, will play a major role. We hope to see you again on Wednesday. Goodbye, and since wine was already mentioned in one of my last sentences, I would also like to invite everyone here in the room for dinner downstairs. So thank you very much, Marion Foucault. <laughs>